This program has been made possible by a generous grant from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Program, conserving our fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for all Vermonters to enjoy. Since the first modern deer season was held in Vermont in 1897, hunting opportunities have steadily evolved as the deer herd and hunter interests have grown. But changes came in a piecemeal fashion, and deer management, hunting season dates, and other rules were controlled by the General Assembly. In 2004, legislators gave the Fish and Wildlife Board greater authority to manage the herd and set new regulations. Since then, the board has made some significant changes and received several petitions to expand hunting opportunities, which earlier this year spurred the Fish and Wildlife Department to launch its first ever comprehensive review of deer management and deer hunting opportunities in Vermont. Join us as we discuss the comprehensive review plan, where it might lead and how the public can weigh in on deer management and outdoor journal special. Welcome to another Outdoor Journal special. Our focus tonight will be on Vermont's new Comprehensive Deer Management Review Plan. I'm Lawrence Pine, your host for the next hour, and joining me tonight to take your calls and discuss this issue are Patrick Berry, Commissioner of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, Adam Murkowski, Vermont's Deer Project Leader, and Brian Ames, Chair of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Board. We welcome your calls if you have questions or comments for our panelists. You can email your questions to connect at vpt.org or you can join our live chat online at vpt.org. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Thanks. For having me. Thanks. Commissioner, I'd like to start with you. We've been hunting deer in Vermont for 116 years now. Why, why a comprehensive deer management review now? Well, I think the introduction gave some pretty good background. We get a lot of feedback from hunters uh, either through the Fish and Wildlife Board process, which I know we'll talk about in a little bit, through the uh, deer hearings about all the different things that we could do in managing deer. It's not so simple as the rifle season. Most people think deer rifle season is that magic two weeks, but there's bow season, rifle season, muzzleloader season. Um, there have been uh, ideas to have an early muzzleloader season, extend the archery season, allow for crossbows, actually potentially move the current rifle season. And rather than... Uh, looking at any one of those by itself because they could have an impact on how you manage the herd in general. We wanted to look at everything more comprehensively while also understanding and being very sensitive to tr traditions that a lot of people share in Vermont about what a hunting season means and having, you know, Adam Murkowski as a new deer project leader allowed us to take a fresh look. So the timing was really good with hunters asking us to do some different things and with having a new deer project leader, it seemed like a really good time for it. And the, and the public's a big part of this process. The public is integral to this process. We're really lucky that we have Vermonters who are very passionate about deer, and they, they love to come to deer hearings and tell us how they feel. A lot of times, people who are happy with the way things are, they like rifle season where it is. They shot a really good buck last year. They're generous. A lot of times, they're not going to show up at those hearings. This was a way to engage everybody, to reach out into the public, find the regular hunters out there who just, they, they love this, this is what they look forward to every year, and get some feedback from them. So um, we did a lot of advertising, we had it on our website, we issued press releases, it was, I think people would have seen it in their local weekly newspaper, looking for folks to be a part of these regional deer groups so that we could get some direct feedback from probably some different folks that may not always come to those regular deer hearings. Brian, the board is, is a part of this review process, and in some respects, you guys really sort of initiated it with the petitions you've been getting and the, the information you've been asking for the department. For the benefit of viewers who aren't familiar with the Fish and Wildlife Board versus the department, what is the board? What is your role? Well, the board's role, the board's the regulatory body for the Fish and Wildlife Department. Uh, there's 14 of us, one from each county. We're appointed by the governor for six-year terms. Um, we deal with things like uh, methods of take, bag limits, seasons, dates, times, uh, those sorts of things. Um, the board is made up of sporting people from around the state. Um, we're the ones with the largest vested interest in the resource, and we're the ones who should be regulating that resource. And Adam, you're new to Vermont. You're a, you're a Wisconsin native, but you've been here for a little over a year now. You've been through some spring deer meetings. You've, you've been through a fall hunting season. 
Before we get into this review process, any impressions on our habitat, our herd, our hunting culture? What, what stands out to you after one year? It, you know, I think, uh, you know, as Commissioner Barry said, uh, Vermont has a very strong hunting tradition, and I've been very impressed uh, not only with the hunters I've talked to in terms of, of their passion for deer hunting, but the types of questions that they ask. Uh, when you listen to a Vermont deer hunter ask, ask me specifically questions, they're asking uh, the types of questions that you wouldn't expect hunters to have uh, an understanding of concepts uh, in terms of uh, when does should be harvested, uh, when season structures should be placed uh, to take advantage of deer behavior. And I've been very impressed uh, with the types of questions uh, that I've been asked. And uh, in terms of Vermont overall, uh, Vermont has a very healthy deer herd and the types of data we're collecting from a management standpoint, uh, Vermont's uh, doing a better job in terms of collecting and, and understanding the health of its deer herd uh, than any other state, uh, many mm -hmm. other states. So that's been good to step into that type of situation with that long history uh, of sound management uh, that really facilitates your ability uh, to interpret what's going on in the deer herd. And, and to have hunters asking intelligent questions uh, means we can have good conversations about deer and deer management. So, so we, we have an informed hunting population and we have the information hopefully that we need. Commissioner, members of your department have said as you know this review that everything's on the table, including that 16 day yeah. rifle season, which you know, for those of us who started hunting in the 1970s, you know, we thought was chiseled in granite somewhere up in the mountains or the state house. Is everything on the table? Season dates, bag limits, implements? Yes. Is anything off limits? Uh, no, I think the short an answer is yes. I mean, there are certain sidewalls within which we have to work. Um, for both the health of the herd and the health of the habitat. And that includes deer densities throughout the state, which um, you know, can vary depending on habitat type, winter conditions. But as far as methods of take and seasons um, and potentially some other opportunities, sure, it's on the table. And I mean, I, you know, we've had some mild winters recently and even some you know, dyed in the wool hunters who love the season where it is, you know, have said, gosh, maybe we should move the whole season back one week into December you know, when, when I was a kid, I used to be able to track bucks in the snow during rifle season. And, you know, I've been able to do that or it's been a very rare occasion. So even that, uh, you know, I guess immovable object in management is something that we at least want to discuss or at least hear how people feel about it and, and add it to the mix. It's interesting. I spent some time researching season dates in Vermont going back all the way to 1897. And, and like a lot of people, our generation, I thought this was what, the way it always was. All four of the seasons we have right now are not in the same form when they were introduced. Youth, bow, muzzleloader, rifle. And if you go back in time, the rifle season was all over the map. It was in October, it was in November, it was a month long, it was eight days long. So there's certainly a precedent for changing season dates. I think a lot of fish and wildlife regulations have been the same for as long as people can remember. But to your point, it doesn't mean that they weren't all over the map for decades prior to that. So, you know, it's, it's, I think it's worth taking a fresh look. Right. And, and I'd just like to remind viewers, we do have a web chat going on. So if, you're, if you wanna be part of the, the discussion, but don't necessarily wanna pose a question, you can go to vpt.org. Adam, this is your baby, uh, big charge. <laughs> Walk us through the, the process. What are the steps of this review? What's the timetable? And I think we have a graphic that shows it. Right, and what's important for hunters to understand is, is even though this is a process, we're at the very first part of that process. And our goal is to gather as much public input as possible. And we really want to understand what hunters think about current uh, season structures and current hunting regulations. And we're doing a good job, I think, of gathering that input. Uh, we've enlisted a, a deer hunter survey uh, to gather additional input. And once we have that input, the next step is going to be uh, to interpret what all that means. Uh, based off what hunters say, uh, what are our options in terms of the limitations of the deer themselves? Um, and look at that. And in order to do so, we want to form uh, some regional working groups uh, made up of hunters throughout the state uh, to interpret that input we're gathering for the areas that they hunt and have conversations about how that can translate uh, into deer hunting regulations. So, uh, you know, first we want to gather input, uh, we want to interpret that input, and then we want to come back to the hunters of Vermont in terms of additional public meetings uh, and an additional deer hunter survey to make sure uh, that that input that we've gotten and interpreted, uh, that we can go back to those hunters and say, this is what we heard, 
Uh, and this is what we think it means in terms of management options. And make sure that we have that iterative process uh, where uh, a good dialogue and conversation is happening. And it's important to understand that even though Vermont's a small state, uh, there's really a diversity of things going on in terms of habitat. Well, you, you, you have three different working groups, right? To, That's correct. To reflect that diversity. That's correct. And your random surveys, the working groups, meetings, I mean, there's tons of opportunity to weigh in. And tonight, uh, if you're sure. so inclined. All right, um, Brian, so fall of 2012 or 2013, we'll have some recommendations. They'll go to your board. What's the next step? What does the board do? Will you hold hearings after all this public input? We will. We'll sort through all the data. I mean, the department will bring us a, a proposal and a, and a presentation at one of our board meetings where we'll go through all this data. And the board will decide which parts they really think they ought to incorporate or seek to incorporate based on the data, their interpretation of the data. Um, if we decide to move forward with changes, the board will definitely have public hearings. And I think in 2014, the spring, late winter and spring, you can expect. So, so actual regulation changes, be it legalizing crossbows mm -hmm. or extended archery, we wouldn't see them till the fall of 2014. That's correct. All right, yeah. so, the, so there's still a ways out. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, I did a little research on deer season dates, and I found something that, that I thought was fascinating that I want to share with the viewers and, and share with you folks, and that is the cover of the 1917 Fish and Wildlife Law Book. Um, sort of proving the old adage that the more things change, the more they stay the same. The deer population was only about 20,000 then. The, the deer kill was very low. But there was complaints about antlerless hunting. The state had held three seasons. There were complaints about deer damage. There was complaints about season dates. And this is what the poor commissioner at the time uh, felt compelled to put on the cover of the law book. Fishing game laws are not ordinary laws, or not laws in the ordinary acceptation of the terms. They are rules and regulations prescribed by the state for the benefit of the people and the protection of the game. Your cooperation is requested. Yeah. <laughs> is that, does that still hold true today? I mean, that balance of, of satisfying the public, protecting the resource, and trying to make everybody happy, or at least buy in. I mean, one of, the, one of the most important aspects of having a robust public process is because some wildlife management is very much about biology, ecology, the animals, the habitat, but a lot of it is social. What do people want to see out of their deer hunting opportunities? I mean, that's why the antler point restriction was put into place in 2005. So, you know, to be able to look at all of the different options out there, is very, it's, it's very similar to what he's talking, you know, it's, it's, it's very much social and biological. And, and the public's cooperation is requested. All right, we have our first <laughs> yeah. caller, uh, Rodney from Duxbury. Go ahead, Rodney. Hi, I guess my question is, how can they put a limit on deer what, when they don't know what the winter kill is gonna be? How can you put a, a limit on deer when you don't know what the winter kill is? Um, I'm not, Maybe his question is is related to uh, knowing what our antlerless season proposal would be, right. but we don't actually make those recommendations until we after we have looked at the winter severity index, which gives us a good indication of how harsh the winter has been, and and uh, we've got a lot of really good data that tells us what the winter kill would be. So you know, hopefully that's what the caller was referring to. So we do wait till we have that data before we make recommendations. And, and you have health matrix or measurements from the fall, you know, how the deer herd was going in, what the winter is, and that's, that's what drives the analyst process. It really is, and what's important for hunters to understand is that each year the department is aging and looking at the health of a large number of deer, and that information, uh, when you look at individual deer, uh, by looking at individual deer, you can tell how healthy the deer herd is by looking at how healthy individual deer are. So each year, uh, the department is aging and examining a large number of those deer. We also have mandatory registration, so we know how many deer were harvested and where. And I think uh, the commissioner hit it right on the head is, once we have that information, it's a matter of waiting for uh, winter to pass. And we have a good understanding uh, of what winter means, uh, the severity of the winter in terms of the impact on the deer herd. And we collect that information across the state. So uh, once we have harvest information and health information, uh, we have that winter severity information. Uh, we're in a position to interpret uh, the status of the deer herd and make some recommendations on what we think the next year's hunting season should be. And, and Adam, we have a, a graphic showing the, the uh, winter severity index over the last 20 or so years. 
And, and that's a measure of days when the temperature is below zero and snow depths are above 18 inches, which is about the height of a deer's belly? That's right. Uh, winter severity, uh, we have a number of volunteers throughout the state that collect this information so we can interpret it regionally. Uh, but every day that the temperature drops below zero or the uh, snow depth exceeds 18 inches, which is the depth at which snow hits a fawn's belly, uh, we record a point um, because those are conditions that put uh, additional stress on, on the deer as they make it through and, winter. And that graph certainly shows what I think we all empirically yeah. know, which was the last two winters were pretty darn mild. In fact, yeah. the last winter, uh, the 2012 winter, was the mildest since the state's been tracking that. I want to get to some email questions. Uh, the first one is from Ed in Brandon. I have attended one of the spring deer meetings almost every year for the past 10 years, and every year hunters say the same thing. We'd like to see more deer out there, but nothing changes. You keep on issuing lots of antlerless permits and managing deer at the same low level. It's very discouraging, especially when you take a kid out and cannot even show them a deer. My question is, why should we believe you when you say you want hunter input? That's pretty. It's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question, but I, as I mentioned earlier, I'd say two things. One, there are certain sidewalls within which we have to work. I mean, we're actually not just in terms of our mission in the department in, in wildlife management, but we're statutorily required to manage deer within the available habitat resources. And, you know, I've mentioned this before. I mean, you know, Vermont deer hunting and deer populations have changed as the habitat has changed. When whereas we, you know, used to be able to support a couple hundred thousand deer, they maybe they weren't as healthy as they are now. We just don't have the habitat. Um, but, you know, we also, you know, these hearings are important to get feedback on a variety of different things, and certainly we hear a lot about that, and certainly deer hunters gauge a lot of their success by what they see. Uh, I mean... But, but what, what's the harm yeah. of managing for a few more deer? We know, we saw right. it in the early 1980s, if we want to knock the deer herd down, we can do it very quickly. We did, what's, what's the harm of just bumping it up 10%? We did surveys, and we asked Vermonters whether they wanted to see bigger deer, and the answer was yes. And in a place like Vermont, this is not Ohio or Pennsylvania as much as people would love it to be, with at the northern edge of the range with severe winters and some limited habitat, you can either have big deer or you can have a lot of deer. It's really hard to manage for both. In certain parts of the state, we do. So we, we did listen to hunters when they told us they wanted bigger deer, and that's over the last you know six or seven years, that's what we've been managing for. And some people may disagree with that, and that's, I think, what that but question is So about. you're saying that, that more people want the big deer than want... At least surveys from... You I know, mean, it's certainly something you hear yeah. a lot of. I yeah. go out there and I don't see deer. We have a caller on the line from Eden. Eden, go ahead, please. Yes, um, I'm curious. I would like to see some spike horns being shot instead of instead of the person having the choice shooting that nice, beautiful four-pointer that's going to be the good genes is what we're taking out just to save these spike horns. So it, it gets to the antler point restrictions. Um which a lot of people like, and I'll put myself in that category. I'm seeing better age distribution, but there are concerns about protecting spike horns that were high grading the herd, genetically modifying it. Antler restrictions are part of this discussion, this Absolutely. review? Absolutely, and, and uh, for those viewers that don't know, high grading is a forestry term right, right. Uh, that uh, you go into a forest stand and, and you remove the good bucks uh, or the good trees. Uh, you know, and, and if you do that repeatedly enough, uh, all you have are the lower quality trees growing and that over time dilutes uh, the quality of your stand. So uh, I think what's important for hunters to ask uh, is what are antler point restrictions? And antler point restrictions are a hard hunting regulation, a harvest uh, regulation that is meant uh, to move deer from the year and a half year old age class into the two year old age class. And the antler point restriction uh, has been successful in doing so. So the antler point restriction is really a harvest selection criteria imposed upon hunters uh, to have a goal uh, of a diversified buck age structure. So, you know, are there better ways of doing that? Uh, certainly, uh, there are a number of ways you could achieve the same thing. And I think anywhere uh, antler point restrictions or any type of artificial selection criteria that have been implemented on the deer herd, uh, there's long-term concerns for the health of those. And that would occur uh, whether there's a two point on the side uh, rule or a three point on the side rule. So, you know, that's a definitely a legitimate concern, but it's a concern that's going to be there uh, regardless of 
uh, the antler point restriction as long as there's that artificial selection criteria. One of the other concerns I hear about the antler point restriction is that it's, it's costing us opportunities to put deer in the freezer, you know, primarily during the rifle season when the vast majority of hunters are afield. Uh, it's a concern I've heard, and, and I went back and looked at some of the, the uh, annual harvests since the antler point restrictions went into place, our annual buck harvest uh, averaged out is just a smidge over 8,000. In the seven years prior to the antler point restrictions, it was over 10,500, which is a pretty big di difference. Is it costing us opportunities to, to put venison in the freezer, which is one of the big reasons a lot of people hunt, certainly one of the reasons I hunt. Right. And so between the time you mentioned and, and present, uh, deer densities were reduced in some areas uh, to meet management objectives. And so the number of bucks harvested uh, may not be simply so a function it's of... It's not apples to uh, apples. May not be a function of the antler point restriction. But, you know, I think you are right. In a lot of places in Vermont, uh, big woods scenarios uh, where people don't have a lot of time to hunt, uh, that's a low deer density, low shot opportunity type situation. So uh, when that opportunity to harvest a buck occurs, I can certainly understand how it can be frustrating to have hunters uh, have to hunt under an antler point restriction and reduce their own personal opportunity to harvest a deer. Uh, so I think, you know, I think that's a very valid point, um, and, and I think it's certainly a good topic to, uh, to have some discussions about. I think one of the reasons it's worked as well as it has is, as far as moving those deer, those bucks into the older age classes, sometimes you just don't have that long to size up a deer, and you err on the side of of you know being safe and that lets some maybe smaller two points get by I'd like to get back to another email question uh, we've been talking about hunters but this one is from db in newport how do the interests of non-hunters the vast majority of vermonters get reflected in the decisions of the board when the board is made up exclusively of only one stakeholder group focused on hunting issues does the board have a representative of wildlife values other than consumptive values? And if not, what steps are Mr. Barry and Mr. Ames doing to ensure that all Vermonters have a seat at the decision-making table? All the Fish and Wildlife Board, while we're made up of consumptive users, are uh, citizens of the state of Vermont with the same concerns as those who, who don't uh, hunt, fish, and trap. Um, so I think the greater good that we accomplish there for the overall wildlife in the state of Vermont is benefited by all. Yeah, I mean, we also have open Fish and Wildlife Board meetings where anybody can come and, you know, with Brian as chair and, and actually the entire board, they, they really welcome public input. And then for any regulation that's proposed, there are always a series of hearings, or almost always, when, you know, we know it's something people are going to be interested in. So regardless of whether there's specific representation, there's a lot of room and opportunity for people to talk to the department, the board, speak at public hearings, and represent, I guess, you know, the non-consumptive community. Well, you certainly hear from other stakeholders at the meetings I've been to, foresters, sure. property owners, et cetera. And I guess you can make the point that by responsibly managing deer, you're benefiting people who enjoy wildlife in general because deer can be so destructive to habitat mm -hmm. if given a chance. Yeah. All right, we have another caller on the line, Mark from Brattleboro. Hello, Mark. How are we doing? We're well. You have a question or comment? Yeah, I get a lot of questions. Uh, I, <laughs> I would like to know why in southern Vermont here we're shooting so many doe during black powder when they're all pregnant. And we don't have enough deer down here to warrant shooting doe that are pregnant. So the I mean, I, I mean, when you can ride around five days a week in the afternoon, I mean, even out of season and not see no deer, I mean, what, what, what's up with that? So, all right, I, I think I get the gist of your question. First, the, the timing of, of our antlerless harvest doesn't sit well with some people. It's, it's after the rut, after they've been bred. And I get the sense he thinks in, in his neck of the woods, we're taking out too many deer. So two, two questions. Right, and, and what's likely happened in his neck of the woods is that the forest has grown up and can support less deer. And regardless of the number of antlerless permits we issue, uh, if we did not harvest those deer, um, they would simply succumb to uh, environmental stress the next time we had a hard winter. So, uh, you know, to answer your question about why you may or may not be seeing deer, you know, without uh, personally evaluating what's going on in the area immediately around where you hunt, uh, it's difficult to say. But in a broad sense, Vermont's habitat uh, and forest composition has changed in ways uh, that I think we should acknowledge are not beneficial to the white-tailed deer. Um, in terms of 
of uh, <laughs> shooting does during the, the muzzleloader season. I think if you look at Vermont's deer management strategy and you look at our overall doe harvest strategy, our antlerless harvest strategy, uh, each year uh, we're looking to harvest a very small percentage of the antlerless population. Uh, we're looking to harvest 8, 10, 15 percent, depending on the region and the objective. Uh, if you compare that uh, to a native state like my Wisconsin, uh, you know, we're looking to harvest 25, 30, 35 percent of the antlerless deer. Uh, so just the nature of our antlerless harvest is conservative because we understand the changes in habitat composition, uh, the severity of the winter deer at their northern edge of their range. Uh, so half of those deer are harvested during the late muzzleloader season. So first of all, we're not harvesting many of the antlerless deer every year, uh, and only about half of those that we do are harvested during the late muzzleloader Both season. Both hunters are taking the antlerless deer. deer and Certainly the youth hunters are taking antlerless right. deer. And a lot of deer hunters would tell you coyotes are taking deer. Um, it's certainly an issue you guys hear a lot about. We were at the St. Albans deer hearing uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and it was an issue that, that came up frequently, and I believe we have a, a montage of some of the comments. We have too many coyotes in the state, it's plain and simple. Everybody here, if we did a toll, everybody would tell you there's too many coyotes. They're, they don't affect, yes, our mature deer and our healthy deer. They do affect our fawns. Our fawns are our future. Last year I shot four coyotes just during the deer season. I mean, they're like all over the place. Uh, even this year we're seeing like fewer deer in our area, a lot of coyote tracks. You'll find that there's plenty of data out there in Maine that basically has a very valid concern that coyotes are taking a big chunk out of the deer herd as far as fawn recruitment in the spring. I mean, there's a lot of fawns being harvested by, the, by coyotes right now. If you wait to see that, then you've already waited too long, haven't you? Why is it you care about everything else, but you don't seem to care about the coyotes that are, that are killing off uh, our deer hunting and, and other animals? In the woods that I hunt in, if you shoot a deer with a bow and you go, eh, I'm not sure about the hit, let's let it set for two hours. By the time you get there to get on that deer, you know where it is because the coyotes are already on it. Coyote predation is a problem. There's no doubt about it. I don't think there's anything you guys are going to do about it. But everybody that's stand, sitting in this room tonight are hunters. If you got a problem with coyotes, get yourself a coyote call. Get yourself an electronic call. Go out and whack a few. You get coyote questions. First off, coyotes eat deer. We, we accept that, they eat deer. <laughs> no one's denying that the coyotes and predate they, deer. They, they, they predate fawns. So how does that factor in if, 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 if that is the case? Right, and you know, we do hear from a lot of hunters that they're concerned about the number of coyotes they see and, and the effect that predation may be having on the deer herd. Uh, and I think it's understandable. A lot of our hunters are, are aging. Uh, and when they grew up, there were not as many predators on the landscape. So to them, uh, having this amount of, of, of uh, diversity of predators on the landscape uh, is something new and, and I can understand how that would influence their perception of, of what's going on. Uh, if you look at Vermont's pop deer population from 04 to 2007 under very restrictive antlerless harvest, uh, we saw tremendous growth in the state's deer herd and that would suggest that predation alone is not enough to slow the growth of deer herds in many parts of the state. And in terms of Vermont's deer age structure, if you look at our doe population, Vermont has a very good doe age structure and it's comprised of a bunch of very old evenly distributed out does and this is reflective of our antlerless uh, harvest and it means that even if predation is occurring that we always have a stock of deer that are there uh, to quickly replenish um, any that are lost and no one's denying that predation on adult deer to some extent occurs and that predation on fawns can be a significant factor uh, in regulating deer numbers. In terms of how you can account for that, uh, I think uh, we hear from a lot of hunters, they like to see bounties or some type of initiative undertaken to reduce coyote numbers. I think that's an unwise use of sportsman dollars. I think that's money that would be much better spent on habitat initiatives because deer are a byproduct of their habitat. And uh, good fawning cover comes from good deer habitat. So, uh, you know, in terms of what we can do uh, for coyote numbers, I think it's important that hunters understand that we're taking that into account when we model deer populations in terms of overwinter survival and over summer fawn survival and it is a significant factor uh, in in our interpretation of the harvest data and we certainly certainly take into account predation. So it's built into your models like winter severity in terms of how many antlerless permits we need to issue. Exactly. All right. 
and I was surprised that you have the authority to to essentially institute a, a coyote right. bounty program as long as it doesn't involve poison. But um, as Adam said, probably a better use well, of poison dollars. You know, that's a tough one is where you're going to get the money from. And I think that uh, socially that would be a challenge, too. I mean, as Vermont's demographics change. But I mean, we have very liberal seasons for method and take of coyote, 365 days a year. Uh, you know, you can trap them, you can shoot them, you can run well, them with dogs. Well, here's, here's something that was raised at the St. Yeah. Albans issue that yeah. is, is for Brian's board to consider, which is you cannot night hunt them. And in Maine and New York, you're allowed to hunt them during a very limited winter season with nights. And, and people will tell you that your, your odds of calling it a coyote are much better. They're much more active at night. Is that something the board would ever consider? I think we would. Um, I, one of my employees, an avid coyote hunter, he hunts under the full moon. It's probably when he's the most successful, actually. Um, he's constantly after me about, you know, in New York, you can hunt with a light at night. Um, there's hurdles we've got to get over with that, you know. Uh, law enforcement, law enforcement concerns. Uh, you know, concerns. Um, but it is done in other states, so I do think it's something we can look at and huh. possibly liberalize. We have another caller, uh, Gary from Holland. Go ahead, Gary. Thank you for holding. Hey, how you doing? Thank you for taking my call. Um, Pat, Barry, this is Gary Shantney in Holland. How you doing? Hey, Gary, how are you? Good, <laughs> good. Sorry, how are you doing? Um, I got a couple questions. Uh, well, one to touch on the antler restriction. Um, I know my uh, brother there, we have dairy farms, and um, I... I have a lot of time to hunt. Uh, my brother runs a farm. He doesn't. Um, and he <laughs> complains a lot because when he does go out and he sees uh, spike corn, uh, he'd like to have some deer meat in the freezer. Um, I just think it, you know, different strokes for different folks. It might be something that needs to be looked at. Um, but as far as this area, too, there's a lot of state land up here um, that I think could be very conducive to a lot of nice bucks. Um, large deer, and I know access and habitat is a big concern with a lot of guys. They don't want to go out there because they don't see any deer. And I didn't know if there's any way you guys are working currently or can with like A&R or somebody like that to, I don't know, strip cut or, you know, to improve the habitat on the state land. And, and Gary, you're, you're right next to the, uh, the Sladic WMA, which is one of the right. largest WMAs yeah. in the state. Yeah. What, what's going on there, Pat? We, you know, actually that part of the uh, the state where we have a lot of land, Gary, uh, we actually do a lot of active management there. Probably more up there than other parts of the state. I mean, we have to we have to look at what property we have and see if it's conducive to to active management. But you know, there's been a fair amount of timber harvest off a lot of those WMAs up there. You know, the Sladic is one, Steam Millbrook is another. Um, you know, there's some state forest up there, which aren't too far, you know, isn't too far away. There's the Atlas Timberlands up there where there's a lot of harvesting done. I mean, that part of the state is right on this fine dividing line between, you know, that Magog Valley, the Memphis Magog Valley. And I, I know where his, his brother's farm is, is right on the Derby Road, Holland right there. And then when you get beyond that, you get to more of the, the boreal forest. Um, which is a very different kind of habitat, which we actually had talked about well, earlier. Well, I, I want to I yeah. get to an email that addresses sure. that specifically, and it's from a former board member, Walt Driscoll of Island Pond. <clears throat> wildlife Management Unit E has the largest square miles of potential deer range of any wildlife management unit in Vermont, yet consistently has the lowest deer per square mile and the lowest deer kill in the state, despite no muzzleloader doe permits or the taking of does during archery season, Hunters that hunt WMUE are at a loss as to why the deer herd has not rebounded since the 1980s. Some blame the loss of cri critical winter, winter habitat, the logging, others blame moose, coyotes, poaching. What does Vermont's whitetail deer management team feel are the reasons for the deer herd not rebounding and what can be done about it? And before you answer, because when I received Walt's email, I went and looked at the, uh, the annual harvest reports and it, he's spot on with E. Um, it's it has not grown it stayed very low and in fact is is trending down last year it was 0.26 bucks per mile which means one buck per four square miles and i also looked at i and p which are similar they're national forest land tremendous public opportunity low deer densities ice central green mountains p is southern and they're very low and have stayed low despite no antlerless permits. And in fact, both of them declined last year also. Do we know what's going on in these areas? 
I mean, we're protecting the antlerless deer. Shouldn't we see some growth and having mild winters? Right, and WMUE is Essex County, uh, and, that, and that's yeah. a very unique area in Vermont. In fact, uh, in terms of habitat composition, that's uh, completely different than anything else that's happening in the state, and it's that boreal uh, northern uh, type habitat, and, and so that's unique in and of itself. And I think Walt's correct. There's, uh, you know, a lot of questions to be asked and answered in relation to why the deer population hasn't increased. I will say if you walk around some wildlife management areas and some deer yards in, in Essex County, uh, there's no doubt that you can see the presence of past uh, high deer numbers. And those deer yards are browsed. And so at some point in the past, you can see evidence of there being too many deer. And you don't see any browsing pressure currently on a lot of those yards, suggesting that density is much lower. And why haven't the deer responded? I think there could be a number of reasons for that, but I think ultimately they go back to there being uh, too many deer at one point in time, uh, and then a loss of some critical cover. Uh, there's been a lot of changes in terms of forest activity, and that's uh, not been always positive for uh, deer wintering well, areas. Well, champion cut off a lot of the deer yards in the Mohegan Basin that have not regenerated yet, so that might be part of it also. That, that certainly could be part of it. There's also not a lot of summer range uh, in Essex County. If you're worried about your deer getting through winter, the best thing you can do is provide adequate summer range. And by that I mean uh, in clear-cut type situations, one to three-year-old early successional habitat that provides well, a lot of grasses and forbs. There is there the Pat and I are both grouse hunters, and there's early successional cover in, in E, not necessarily in I and P, where the forest is steadily maturing, and there's very little of that summer habitat you're talking right. about. Right, and uh, you but know. To, to get to Walt's question, though, I mean, is there anything that you, I mean, other than saying we're not going to harvest antlerless deer, is there anything you can do about it? Well, you know, in Essex County, again, uh, that's a very unique situation, uh, mm -hmm. and we, he's right, we haven't issued antlerless permits there for a long time, and we haven't seen that uh, rebound in the deer population. And so, uh, you know, if you look at the host of factors acting upon that deer herd, uh, they're at the most extreme weather conditions, uh, and they're also susceptible to uh, the highest levels of predators. There's some very high predator densities in that part uh, of the state. And so it's not implausible to think that had deer densities reduced um, for whatever reason, uh, that they may have a difficult time rebounding uh, due to those environmental factors playing on the deer herd. And, um, I think it's hard to say that any one thing is the definitive causative answer as to what's going on in E, uh, but it's most likely a suite of things acting simultaneously but, but on the deer the herd. the goal of the department and the board is to grow the herd in these areas. I mean, you, you look at them, they all have well over 100,000 acres of publicly accessible land. I mean, they're, they're wonderful places to go, but you know, people want to cut a deer track, see a deer. Uh, we have a caller on the line from South Glens Falls, New York. Go ahead, caller. Yes, sir. How are you doing today? We're well. How are you? Fine, thank you. I was wondering about, uh, I know the coyotes, uh, they get the deer and their fawns, but uh, it seems like the population of the coyotes, as the gentleman just said, that uh, there's quite a few of them I hunt up in the upper state of New York and the Adirondacks. And I was wondering about these turkeys that, um, you know, when the beech nut is, right, the beech nuts are good, all these turkeys are up there scratching up the ridges and stuff like that. I was wondering about these uh, turkeys doing a harm on the deer that they don't have, you know, their feed. I, I got your question, and it's it's one I'm sure you guys have hear, heard before. You see a, a flock of turkeys going through the woods in the fall, and they're hoovering up those acorns and beech nuts, and the complaint is they're not leaving anything for deer. Um, and we've seen turkeys come back quite a bit. Is there any truth to that? Go ahead and tackle this one. I mean, <laughs> uh, that's why you hired them. Right? Well, I, you know, <laughs> so turkeys. Uh, you know, there's no doubt. You know, Vermont made efforts to restore turkeys, and that's mm -hmm. been a very successful uh, conservation story and true testament uh, to the conservation mindset of sportsmen and women. Uh, and turkeys generally do not eat the same things as deer throughout the year. And in the fall, uh, when there's a good mass crop, uh, that's a time of plenty for all wildlife. And if you looked at studies that examine that exact question, you know, the turkeys are eating all the acorns, what you see is no matter how many deer turkeys there are, small mammals get most of the acorns, your chipmunks, squirrels, uh, and rodents. They're eating a large majority of those 
uh, regardless of how many there are. So and bears to, and, 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 and bears bigger, and, bigger and, critters. And, and there's all kinds of, of animals. And Vermont's wildlife populations are very healthy. And uh, you know we go through great efforts to protect those mass-producing areas. Uh, and that's to benefit all wildlife, including turkeys and deer. And so I wouldn't be worried about any competition between deer and turkeys uh, for mass crops or for any food throughout the year. I, I would say too, it's really interesting in Vermont, a lot of people did not grow up hunting turkeys. There's generations of deer hunting culture and tradition. Um, and there's folks that don't necessarily hunt turkeys. So t turkeys are not viewed by all hunters as being as great as I happen to think they are. I mean, I love turkey hunting and I, you know, I know Brian does and I know you do. Um, but, you know, we're still building that tradition of people, you know, respecting them. And, you know, I've heard all kinds of turkeys called all kinds of nasty names. Um, just because we don't necessarily have that, that same tradition. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, there's parts of the state that have only recently been open to turkey hunting. I so think, is, yeah, and I don't want to, you know, get off on turkeys, but I, I think we're also, we're still figuring out turkeys. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible conservation victory to be able to reintroduce them. But, you know, in parts of the Northeast now, turkey populations are beginning to decline. Right. When they're first introduced, they go very high, they stay high, and then they drop and they stabilize. So. You know, we, I get a lot of complaints about um, nuisance turkey damage, actually, more, more and more. But I think over time, we're going to see those numbers reduce a little bit and stabilize. All right. <clears throat> I want to go to another email. Uh, it's actually three questions, um, two of which I'm not sure we've addressed. Are the powers that be, it's from Dahan in St. Albans, are the powers that be considering legalizing crossbows for deer hunting, and I assume archery hunting, Will there ever be an early doe harvest at the beginning of the season and a bounty on coyotes? Bounty on coyotes, we've, we've discussed crossbows. Where does that stand? I mean, that's something that is, is pretty contentious. It's been brought it's to your been board's contentious. attention. We re the board received three petitions all in the space of a couple of months. Uh, so we looked into liberalizing the use of crossbows and went, asked the department to give us a presentation, do some research, give us a presentation on the history of crossbows, what's happening to them, uh, nationwide, we're finding a liberalization of crossbows nationwide, um, and we really started to delve into it. And I think we, the board was definitely moving towards a liberalization of crossbows in some manner, um, whether it's a season of its own or as part of regular archer equipment was yet to be determined. Council slowed us down a little bit that we may have been getting ahead of our actual authority. So this year in legislature, we've asked authority. Uh, the department has, on the board's behalf, asked uh, authority to regulate the use of crossbows. If granted this year, I expect that maybe we will get it, the board get the authority, we will look at that issue. And, and, and when you look at other states, I mean, there's a range of options. Some states do it just for hunters above a certain age or for just the late archery mm -hmm. season or, you know, some states do it across the board, mm -hmm. but it, it seems like you have a suite of options. I th we certainly do. And I think the board will look at all those options. And uh, the same as with any rule, uh, We'll definitely have some public hearings on, on the issue and get it input from as many people as we can. Well, that leads to another question, the public, in, public input in this review process. Does there need to be a consensus? I mean, you did your survey and it showed hunters were kind of split about crossbows. Um, does there need to be a comfortable majority of hunters favoring a change like that before the department would recommend it or the board would approve it? I think there, there needs to be a, a good portion of people, a good percentage of the people who are comfortable with it. But um, right now our system is set up that pretty much anybody who really wants to crossbow hunt can crossbow hunt in Vermont with, with a, a doctor's note and, and you know, disability of sorts. But um, we all know people who are crossbow hunting who, who are kind of working the system. Right. So um, I do think it's well worth looking at and I think it's something that even many who are opposed to it may, may turn around if we present it right. If we come up with a system that uh, most can in, can adapt to. And how about the early muzzleloader season? We, that, that's certainly been on the table before. Yeah. Well, that's a really good point that it had been on the table before. You know, again, we did surveys to reach out to hunters and see if they were interested in. The majority of hunters supported this early um, muzzleloader season. In fact, it goes to the question that the gentleman had asked earlier about shooting does, you know, before they're pregnant. Um, but when we held the hearings, None of those people that said that they supported it showed up. Uh, and your boss was, was kind of outspoken. The <laughs> governor was, yeah, wasn't in, in favor well, of that. It was a traditional deer hunter. He was, yes, he was listening to those hearings. And I think he, you know, traditional is a good, good point, too, that people are used to having muzzleloader season in December. But I think 
I think it underscores the point that um, just because you're happy with something doesn't mean you should stay home during those deer hearings. You know, if you like something, it's also important to show up and support that. Um, and, you know, we just didn't have those Vermonters that said that they supported that early muzzleloader season just didn't show up. And everybody that didn't like it seemed to have bring their entire family and neighbors with them. And, and that's the yeah. benefit of the random survey you're going to do where you'll yes. get a, a more yeah. represent. It's not squeaky wheels. We have a caller on the line from Barry City. Thank you for holding. Go ahead. Yeah, I was curious why um, there isn't just a one deer um, limit for all three seasons. Good question. And it, that, that certainly fluctuated over the years. We've had a one deer annual limit. We've had a two deer annual limit. We now have a three deer annual limit. Why, why three? Should people be concerned about that? Right, and that goes to an overriding question of why are season structures uh, structured the way they are? And, and there's a number of ways of achieving your management objectives. And what's important to understand if you're hunters is that there are places in Vermont where they are locally overabundant. And hunters need to have those tools in their toolbox uh, to manage their local deer herds for deer herd health. And the three deer limit allows hunters the ability to do that. And one premise of our management system is that we rely on hunters to make informed harvest decisions. Uh, just because there's a three deer limit doesn't mean it's appropriate to harvest three deer in, in all areas of the state. And we understand that. So to some degree, uh, we're relying on hunters to make informed decisions, but we still have to have the tools uh, available to hunters so they can continue to manage the local deer herds uh, and make sure that agricultural damage, uh, timber resources aren't being, um, you know, overexploited by the deer themselves. And, and the reality is, <laughs> Commissioner, that are a lot of people taking No, I, I, I was going to mention that too. I mean, I can't remember what the numbers were for last year, but the year before, I think there were 256 hunters that took a three deer, you know, their, their limit out of a herd of somewhere between 120 and 140,000, depending on the, depending on the year. So biologically, it doesn't matter. But I do think it's important to respect the caller's point that, again, deer management is often a social issue. Mm -hmm. And it's something we are going to look at as a part of the comprehensive process, that it matters to people that they feel as though they are going to have a better opportunity if other hunters don't necessarily take three deer. I don't like the idea of limiting opportunity where there's not biological impact, but I don't want to dismiss the caller's concern about what it means to somebody that, you know, somebody else is taking three deer and they're struggling, you know, yeah. getting one. Well, it, it can create other issues. I have a brother who lives in Maine, a very rural part of Maine, where the annual limit is one, and he has uh, observed that the the wives of all his neighbors are really good deer hunters <laughs> right, because right. they yeah. all get their bucks before their husbands do. So that yeah. one deer yeah. limit. Um, and we have another caller on the line. Go ahead, caller. No caller? Yes, it's Danny oh, yeah. from Ludlow. Go ahead, Ludlow. Yes, um, I'm just calling. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be one of the um, few, I think, in this state. I'm a fourth-generation hunter. I live here in Ludlow, Vermont. Um, there's uh, Obviously, we have the um, ski industry and whatnot, uh, which is actually cut into um, the deer population and or my hunting uh, area. Uh, what has the out-of-state uh, influence uh, done um, in, in the decision-making of the state of Vermont regarding uh, just about any of the deer. Well, deer uh, how, how, is it cut into your, how is it cut into your hunting opportunity in terms of development or posting? How is it? Absolutely. Post. It's um, a combination of development. Um, uh, unfortunately, I've been looking at trying to get into more posting myself. Um, and it's restricted. I'm one that goes and has an opportunity to spend many an hours uh, in the woods to hunt. Um, but unfortunately, uh, there's there's less and less uh, area to hunt on in this area. Yeah, I mean the the the, the caller's absolutely right that there are uh, changing access patterns across the state. I mean, the top two reasons people get out of hunting: one is age, and the second is access. And in parts of the state. Uh, land is being posted at an alarming rate and people aren't able to get onto property and this creates a problem too not just for hunter satisfaction and frustration for folks like the caller but also it makes it really difficult to properly manage deer we get some some of the most 
intense complaints about you know locally overabundant browsing from parts of the state with the highest uh, number of acreage of posted land because when deer are pressured on that little bits of land that are accessible they end up on posted property uh, and you know that we we can't manage those numbers to uh, to where we want to get to to for our deer management objective so um, yeah, posting is a big issue and actually we're in the process right now of working on um, you know a landowner hunter uh, relationship program. Um, you know, we're uh, in the legislature right now. We've got some language in a bill that we're moving to try to allow people to post their land by permission um, to try to give a more welcoming view from the outside looking in. Um, but it's it's definitely an issue that I, I would say is that you know the two biggest threats to deer hunting in you know in the future is is going to be habitat and access more than anything else. You know, and, it, yeah. and it's not just. Southern Vermont ski areas. We have a uh, an email question comment from Greg Walsh in Essex Junction. The amount of posting seems to be on the increase, especially in areas where access to tracts of land behind rural clusters of homes have sprung up. This is especially evident in Chittenden County, where it appears one or more property owners against hunting solicit their neighbors on a grand scale to block off access to large tracts. Can't the state find any way to reward property owners against posting? particularly against what I call strip mall posting. I mean, we, we have programs to keep land open as far as in production, agriculture and forestry, and it's been a sore issue at some point, people that a requirement isn't also made to keep it open to the public for, for at least wildlife purposes. Yeah, I mean, people who, you know, big landowners who get in incentives um, for working landscape, you know, through what's called the U current use program, where your land is valued for the use at that time, there's been a fairly big push. It comes up at all the deer hearings. I get letters about it. It's come up in the legislature that, you know, we could add an incentive onto that program that if you keep your land open, you would get a better incentive. Or if you decide to enroll yourself in current use, that maybe it wouldn't be as, you know, the incentive wouldn't be as great. Um, to try to create that, that goal of having uh, less posted land. Um, so, you know, again, it's, 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 becoming a, it's becoming a big problem. And I'll tell you, you know, we, when we talk about deer management, wildlife management, you know, we do talk about things like antler point restrictions and number of antlerless permits and seasons and dates. And, you know, to me, that's a much smaller portion of what's going to make the biggest difference for the success of hunting for generations to come. And, you know, land fragmentation and parcelization, where we end up with these smaller parcels, I think is the call, the point the caller made. And, and land that is you know, no longer open to access, those land fragmentation, habitat and access issues, that is what is gonna make or break deer hunting for generations to come. You know, a lot of what we're talking about tonight are those smaller steps in terms of you know, hunter satisfaction and, and the things that we can do in this comprehensive strategy, but those are the big ones. Okay. We have another caller on the line from Williston. Go ahead, Williston. Yeah, uh, yes. My question is, does the fishing game get involved with foresters when they're cutting uh, forest? Uh, where I hunted last year, they did clear cutting, and they cut all the beech trees out and left the yellow birch, and they didn't leave any of the beaches for the, the deer to, to, to feed off from. Does the fishing game get involved with the foresters? when there's clear cutting involved on private properties? Good question, thank you. Uh, yeah, what I what mean, is, uh, you know, I mean, certainly if it's an Act 250 scale project, you're involved. Um, right. And I imagine if you're in current use, are you guys involved in reviewing current use management plans at all? You're not. So to right. what extent can you be involved? Yeah. And, and maybe I'm not supposed to be involved, but just yesterday I was out, uh, yeah. you know, with our county forester doing exactly that, you know, talking. Uh, we had a landowner, we had a, a substantial deer yard, and they want to know what they could do to improve it That's and good. they're enrolled in current use so uh, you know I was glad to go out there uh, and give my perspective and what's important to understand is you know current use is about long-term uh, utilization of that landscape to benefit uh, the, you know timber resources and the overall uh, environment so you know how do you balance that uh, with deer management objectives if you're looking to enhance it and those are those are good conversations to have in each area of the state uh, you know, the Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation and Fish and Wildlife. I uh, have interagency uh, working groups that, that collectively go through management uh, plans for the variety of state lands and they do work very collaboratively uh, to ensure that they're balancing uh, those long-term timber resources uh, with wildlife resources. And so there's a, a 
great deal of collaboration right. and, and the, how to the, balance The trick those. is on private land, though, which is still the majority of Vermont's forest. Right. And even though, even though Adam may have been out with a forester, you know, I, I guess what I want people to know is that we don't have authority over, we may be involved on a consultation level, but there's a county forester that works with those private landowners in the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, and they're the ones who help with forestry. We have great uh, regional stewardship teams to work on some of those management plans for public and lands. And some of those county foresters are very sympathetic to wildlife values. Well, I think, I mean, I, you know, I mean, as, as Mike Snyder, Commissioner of Forest Parks and Rec, would say, you know, wildlife and habitat are not just linked. They're the same thing. And I think we're lucky in the Agency of Natural Resources that both our foresters and wildlife managers are coming from the same place. Now, they may have a little bit different take on, you know, specific man land management prescriptions, um, but luckily there's a good enough relationship, and I'm, you know, that Adam might be consulted, uh, you know, for some wildlife values. Because a, a private landowner may not just be interested in how they can actually sustainably harvest some timber and pay their taxes, they may actually be interested in working with a county forester on doing some wildlife habitat management, and that's when we may be brought in to consult. All right. We have a, whoop. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for tonight's program. I'd like to thank our panelists for coming in and all of you for watching. From all of us at VPT's Outdoor Journal, good night.